Welcome everyone. I'm Donna McPhee, Columbia College Class of 1989 and President of the Columbia Alumni Association and Vice President for Alumni Relations at the University. Welcome to the second of the CAA's Columbia at Home webinar series. We're so glad you've joined us. You're in for a treat. Tonight we're joined by three alumni, members of the Columbia Wine Industry Network, for an exciting program about winemaking. This panel will be led by my colleague, Ken Catandella, a co-founder of our wine network. While you were here from two of the co-founders, I wanna give a nod to my fellow Columbia College alum, Brent Bessier, class of 91, co-founder of Fogline Vineyards. He is the third co-founder of this amazing group, and I will be responsibly sipping his Fogline 2013 Russian River Valley Pinot Noir during the next hour. Hopefully you will be sipping something as well. Enjoy. Thank you, Donna. Uh, we have a real treat for everyone, but let me start by thanking all of you uh, for letting us into your homes and hopefully into your wine glasses this evening. We are going to indulge you for a moment, or if I should say, I'm going to ask you to indulge me, and we're going to do a little show and tell. So I'm going to surrender the screen. So ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the curated wines that our three winemakers uh, will highlight this evening. Uh, from left to right on my screen, from Julie Johnson's Tres Sabores Vineyard, Port Cano, which is a red blend, from Maria and Pedro Rivero's RGNY Vineyard on the North Fork of Long Island is their Cab Franc, and from Yoab Galat, uh, share a splash wine company, Angels and Cowboys, Rosé. Next, from the Rivero Gonzalez Winery in Para, Mexico, is a Malbec. And fifth wine is the Tres Sabores Sauvignon Blanc. And finally, the Cannonball Leban uh, Chardonnay from Sonoma Valley, also Yoab Galatz. At this time, I would invite my three winemaking uh, alums and friends to join me. Yoav Galat is a graduate of the Columbia Business School. Julie Johnson is an alumna of the School of Nursing and Maria Rivero attended the School of International and Public Affairs. These are three of our more than 70 alumni who are either winemakers or winery owners and part of a worldwide network of Colombians in the wine industry and ancillary businesses. Yoav, Julie, and Maria, and many other of our alumni winemakers are found on the CAA virtual wine cellar, and many are offering special discounts to the Columbia community during this time. So I'm gonna ask each of our winemakers before we move on, if you can provide us uh, with your code so that uh, after our hour together, um, our alumni and friends can visit your winery. So Yoav, I'll start with you. First of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, you can definitely see wine 24 seven. Our um, code uh, for the alumni network is Columbia 30, which means 30% uh, discount on all our wines. And we do free shipping on 12 hours of wine anywhere in the country. Maria. Hi, um, my name is Maria Rivero. Our code is going to be SALUD, S A L U D, both in uh, Bodega Rivero Gonzalez for Mexico and RGNY for New York State. Yeah. And Julie. Hope you can all see this. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Here's my code for Trace Saboras Wines. See you win Columbia University Wine Industry Network. Um, I'm going to make an additional donation to my alma mater, the front lines of nursing at Columbia Presbyterian. Thank you so much for your support to all these fine people. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks to the three of you. Uh, and you can also follow all of our winemakers on Instagram at CU Winemakers. Now, before we jump in, I need to give a couple of quick shout outs. The first is to the CAA Club of Mexico for their virtual viewing in support of Maria and her brother Pedro. And I received several emails from alums in Tel Aviv calling themselves the alarm setters because as Joab could attest, they had to set their alarms for at least 2.45 a.m. so that they could be on with us today. So, um, and then finally, at the end of Q&A, we will announce the winner of a case of assorted wines from Columbia winemakers. And finally, many of you in the regional clubs and shared interest groups will have the opportunity to participate in virtual tastings with these three uh, winemakers and many of our other winemakers across the globe in the coming weeks and months. All right, let's get to it. So first question, you all did something different in your life before entering the wine industry. Can you briefly tell us what your day job was before and um, what prompted you to uh, change your career path and follow this dream? So Julie, we'll start with you. Hi again, everybody. Well, um, it all started with Columbia, actually. I came to New York. I was in the nursing class of uh, 79, graduated, went up to upstate New York, and then came out here following my soon-to-be husband, Bo, new winemaker who had worked in the upstate New York area, in the Finger Lake area. He helped me just absolutely fall in love with wine. So I went from a starving student to being treated with some Napa's finally. And uh, I continued even as we started first winery that I was involved with, Frog's Leap. Um, I continued to work in a, whole, a local home health agency. What was really cool was meeting in their homes, caring for some of the very founders of the Napa Valley wine community. It was very cool. What a change though, what a change of careers. I had no idea. It's called love and osmosis, I think. That's it. <laughs> Yo, uh. So I'm, uh, I'm Jewish. As a Jewish boy, you have uh, three options. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer or a complete failure. So my, uh, my first journey was, uh, was to become an attorney. And uh, I went to, to law school in the UK and practiced uh, for three years and uh, then decided to be a complete failure and join and do something I really love and have passion for. So I'm a recovering attorney. I guess that's why I drink and that's why I make wine now. But uh, that's uh, my short answer. Great. And Maria? Um, well, I didn't really have time to have to do anything else before this. I, I graduated in 2007 and I briefly worked in a mining company for a few months. But my father had planted the vines in 1998 and I just loved Parras. I loved going there, everything about the fields and seeing those little grapes grow and transform into something beautiful. And uh, I guess also I didn't know at the time, but I had a deep necessity to become an entrepreneur. I love the face pays world about it. And uh, being an entrepreneur in wine is just fun. Great, great. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, the reason that we're all gathered here uh, tonight virtually, um, obviously is because the CAA has created this um, series, Columbia at Home, uh, in response to the fact that we can't gather in person. Um, and by all reports, one of the few industries that is seeing a boom during COVID-19 is the wine industry. Everyone I talk to says, you know, I'm doing well, but man, I'm drinking a lot more wine than I usually do. Um, but um, without restaurants and bars and influencers, many people in the wine industry are struggling. How have each of you had to think differently about your business model uh, during these times. So Joab, I'll start with you on this one. So for us, 40% um, or 35% of our wines are going actually to on-premise, that's how we call it. So restaurants, hotels, wine bars. 
Um, and unfortunately, almost overnight, we, we had to basically stop selling to all those accounts. Um, so for us, it was, uh, first of all, they were shut down at the beginning and then they decided to do the grab and go and take out and things like that. So we decided to really, first of all, to push the, the 375. So we have like half size bottles of wine that people can, uh, restaurants can actually offer it very easily uh, to when they sell their meals, uh, lunch or dinner. So that's something that we're basically offering to restaurants. We lower the price as well. So they have the opportunity to buy the wine at almost, I want to say almost our cost and then um, give that opportunity for, for people to buy half a bottle of wine versus buy a 750. And it helps the restaurant as well to survive uh, during those times. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is um, that we, our DTC, our um, basically wine club, and website. We've been uh, shipping more wine. So every day is almost, uh, that's the only way basically to be able to kind of compensate and to some degree uh, our business. So we, we have a lot of, we are, we're pushing hard and uh, hoping that we, we get new customers and people to try our wines and to parts of the country that we can't, uh, they can't get the wine. Now we can, we open more states uh, and we're promoting the wine on social media and doing what we're doing right now, actually. That's our virtual wine tasting and that's I think the new world we're going to come back to. I actually really like that format so I think for Colombia it's the easiest thing to to basically do is to do those virtual especially when you have winemakers from all over the world so I think it's a it's a phenomenal platform that I think the new world will get used to um, and and um, that's that's basically that we are supporting our distributors we send them whenever we can uh, to the warehouse lunches um, whenever we can help a restaurant just to make them feel good, we send cases of wine and our team is doing whatever they can uh, under shelter in place in most places uh, just to really, really try and support and be, you know, thoughtful as you can um, and hope it will, um, it will be over soon and we'll be eating and dining again and, um, and supporting all those amazing restaurants. I mean, it's, uh, it's very, very important to, I'm saying to everyone, wherever you can, grab a meal and uh, support the restaurant. It's a huge industry that we all need to support and be thankful to. Great. Thank you. Uh, Maria. Um, yeah, we, we definitely had to pivot a lot. Uh, we depend almost 70 or 80 percent of on-premise or tasting room. So with that, with those things not working, it has been very hard on both geographies. In um, here in, in RGNY in New York, we didn't really have the online, the, our website up because it's such a new brand. So we had to speed that up and, and really not having a lot of uh, brand recognition, it's been hard for us to get people to try the wines. Uh, in Mexico, we, we have a little more brand recognition because we've, been, uh, we've had the brand for to almost 12 years. But we've been creating, we created Survival Kids so one of them is tastes like a pro. So you get these three, 375 bottles and you get a little notebook that tells you how to taste with a, with a link to a video. So you can actually learn how to taste like a pro. You even have some no, like a notebook that you can take notes on. And then the other one is a blending, blending uh, how to blend your own wine. So you have three different or three or four different red uh, mono varietals. And then you, uh, we actually send you how to do different blends so you can kind of like work and learn how to be a winemaker for a day but it's it's interesting because you actually can compare one grape next to the other from one same exact region so it becomes something fun and um and we've done other things like caja de campo in mexico so we we put together with a, a restaurant uh, we put together a recipe and we send you a meal for two. So you kind of do the, re the recipe and it's, it also has the wine that, come, that actually goes great with the meal. It, I think it's, uh, the world is definitely going to change after this. I think entertainment and online has to be something that's very strong. But uh, hopefully we'll have people back at the vineyards. It's, it's what I love most, having people actually enjoy the vineyards and being able to walk around and have a, a glass of wine there. Well, I think that's probably a perfect segue for Julie, because I know she feels the same about Trace de Boris. Uh, Julie? It looks like 
we're having a technical difficulty for the moment. So while we're waiting um, for Julie to come back to us, let me pose a quick question to the two of you. If you could pick only one, one element of winemaking, what would you consider to be the single most important element? Is it the fermentation process? Is it the grant? Oh, Julie, are you back with us? I'm back. I'm sorry. This is <laughs> it's one of the problems with being a very small winery back on an alluvial fan on the western bench of Rutherford is that, and my, ironically, my, IP, my ISP has COVID. So he can't service our um, our network. <laughs> so um, I apologize for that. Can I answer that question though? Because yes, yes. I just want to say um, I'm a really small winery, and most of the things that happen here at Trace Saboris in Rutherford um, are really welcoming people literally into the vineyard. Ken, you've been here. You know, you know what it's like. And so many of my close friends are in a similar situation and we've been fully closed down for over six weeks now, which means no visitors to the winery whatsoever. So not unlike a lot of restaurants and a lot of small businesses all over, I think we're in it together, but we're also kind of suffering together. It's been, it's pretty tough to all of us and have something that's so personal directed. So outward and inward and welcoming you know, it's our usual MO just to welcome people here. The, the dogs are bored. In fact, the dogs are, are skinny because they're so used to getting treats from people, you know. But one of the, the couple of things that we're doing, um, we're actually doing uh, partnering with restaurateurs all over the country and doing Zooms with them and with their customers if they're doing takeouts. We're doing Zooms with some of our wine club members and taking out and kind of bringing ourselves into their homes. And you all have, I agree with you. I think this is a model to come for communication in the future. But I just want to say that so many people have been generous to small wineries that just don't have a big presence out there. And uh, I hope it lasts. And I hope that we can continue to give back to our community too. I know right in New York, the James Beard Association and many other associations, GoFundMe accounts, are doing a lot to try to keep restaurateurs and their teams going so hopefully hopefully they can everybody can open up again the um the essay in new york times from the woman owner from gabrielle who owns prune is worth looking up for anyone who wants a great essay on trying to run a small business in the time of covid but it really is dependent on the on i think the kindness of uh, of a whole lot of people out there who recognize small business Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to have a fun question. Uh, and so I'm going to start with you, Maria. Uh, on the holding slide, uh, you know, I talked about two of your wines, just mentioned them. But my question for each of you in, is what is your personal favorite wine of all the wines that you make and why? So, Maria, I'm going to put you on the spot first. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's always a question that's very hard to answer because to me, wine is very much an occasional drink. It depends where you, what you're doing, um, what you're eating, who you're with. Uh, but I guess if I had to mention one, I'm in love with our orange wine that we made in Mexico. I think it's something we made it back in 2014 and we kept it and we only, we only started selling it last year. And I think it's just something very rare for Mexico. And uh, it's full of flavor. It's super funky. And we, we really went all in into minimal intervention, which in the end is, I guess, it's always a dream to be able to not touch it, touch the grapes, I mean, touch the wine or manipulate the wine so much and, and just let the grapes be and express themselves. Okay, well, um, I haven't, in full disclosure, not yet tasted your orange wine, but my favorite is your North Fork uh, RGNY Viognier, as you know. I, I, I just feel it's a, I mean, as you say, it's a pernicious grape, but you've done a wonderful job with it. So, thank you, thank you. Um, 
Yo up. Oh my God. I have, it's like asking a parent, which kid do you like most? Like, who do you love most? I, it's like, look, all the kids are in the back. I think this is an unfair, honestly, unfair question. I have my, my favorite, it just depends on the, on the day. Like, I guess with your kids, sometimes one kid is uh, doing better than others, but uh, it's not, uh, but yeah, I mean, it just depends on the occasion, depends on the day. We just bottled the, the 2019 Rosé, uh, which we make in a really, um, Provence style, and I'm, I'm super excited about that wine. It's Angels and Cowboys, you have it on your background as well. That's the wine that I'm sipping right now. Um, but, uh, you know, Cannonball Cab is our, you know, that's why we started the company, the winery, 15 years ago to make an affordable, fantastic, delicious cab under $20 around the world, and that's what we do. And then Astrolab is our New Zealand property I can go on. I mean, it's really unfair to pick one wine, so I uh, basically saying, they're all great. I love them all. <laughs> well, I will say my favorite uh, is the one wine you don't make in Sonoma or New Zealand, but in Napa, oh. your high dive cab. That's really special. That's, yeah, that's one. Yeah. Yeah. And Julie. I'm going to pour myself a glass. The first rule at Frogs, at, uh, at Trace the Boys is always to pour a glass in. I'm going to pour you a glass of my 17 Zinfandel. And it's kind of fun because today, right now, we're bottling the 18 Zinfandel. I live literally with these grapes. They're 10 feet away from my front door. They were the first certified organic vineyard in the Napa Valley. And they're truly in partnership with healthy soil and with the native environment around here. So, yeah, I'm with you, Lav. I've, I've got a lot of kids. I don't dare say who's my favorite. Um, but, you know, I actually, I love this wine because it was California. The variety was California's first grape. Um, it's my love. This vineyard is almost 50 years old. And the fact that it's been, well, I know what it is. The fact that it's been regenerative, the fact that it's sustained itself, the fact that it's been resilient all these 50 years through fire and drought and everything. Hey, we're gonna get through this. This is what this wine says to me today. We're gonna get through this. It's resilient and it's, I think it's pretty lovely. It's pretty drinkable, Ken. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> I like, that's one of my favorite, but uh, uh, Jorge No uh, Why Not is a very fun wine. Um, it's a very versatile wine. I really enjoy that as well. Uh, my blend. My blend. Uh, yeah. Um, next, qu we're going to do a deep dive question for each of you. And so, Julie, you're up first this time. Um, you've been dedicated to... Uh, really creating a ecosystem at Trace of Boys um, that really is at the forefront of sustainability in um, wine growing, but also uh, farming. Um, you also are in Rutherford and Napa, and climate change has really uh, threatened your way of life. What do you see as the biggest challenge to maintaining um, that amazing close to zero carbon footprint you have uh, when you face climate change? Well, that's a huge question, but I think part of it is just working really hard for best practices, staying attuned with your center, with the Columbia Center, this, this engagement of the winemaking network at Columbia with your climate scientists is very exciting because we lack data. We are an organic farm, but there's not a whole lot of, of data. Um, we know that we're following best practices. We can see and test that our soil is healthier. Resilient soil means resilient vines, great healthy soil full of compost and, the, and microbial matter is, is so rich. It will definitely help at least as a first line defense, help our vines get through this next wave. Right now, this year is the, the, we're only at 17 inches, which is the most profound level of drought at this point for any time since I've lived here at this ranch. So our dry farming and our canopy management and the management of um, the water retention in our soil 
of all of that pulls together in one package. And so my, my son, Rory, from Calder Wines, um, and also at Frog's Leap, uh, we work together to try to stay on top of it. We check in with our neighbors. We share information, which is really key. I think that's something that wine people do really well. But so far, all I can say is the communication between my vines and the soil, there's got to be something magic and wonderful going on, and I want to continue to do that. Um, it's a challenge to be sure, but um, wise farming, conservation-minded farming in all respects, um, it not being afraid to share information that works, I think is, hey, that sounds pretty familiar as a line of thought, huh? Yes. Uh, anyway. <laughs> okay, great. Yoav, um, you are making wine um, two locations half a world apart. How do you compare and contrast uh, not only winemaking and the microclimates, um, but also the varietals um, that you make in Sonoma in particular, but also Napa with that in New Zealand. Yeah, so credit to my winemakers. I mean, first of all, Undine Chadden is our winemaker in Sonoma and she's based in Sonoma. So she's making our Angels and Cowboys and Cannonball and Cannonball 11. And then in, uh, in Napa, we make Kaida with uh, Scott Palazzo and Peter Heights uh, from Turnbull. So I'm, I'm lucky to work with really phenomenal, legendary uh, winemakers that, that, you know, know have been living uh, in Napa and in Sonoma for many years, uh, decades, and they work with growers in the region. So that's, that's on, the, on one side of the globe. The other side is working with Simon Wagon, uh, which uh, one of the best winemakers from, uh, from uh, Marlboro, from New Zealand. Um, so first of all, the credit is to them, not to me, to be honest. They are the other one who have the challenge with, with uh, you know, Mother Nature, with the crazy uh, climate change and everything that is going on. So um, that's, that's for that. I mean, the varietal wise, we actually make Sauvignon Blanc uh, in both places. Of course, everybody talk about uh, Kiwis and as they make the best Sauvignon Blanc in the world. I mean, the French, of course, will say, no, it's us, it's Ansari, it's not you. And then you'll have to go to South Africa, every region will say, so I think it's, it's really an expression of, of the region. And as you mentioned, it's microclimates as well. So it's amazing how much you can get in such a small region. Both, you know, if, if you visit uh, Marlborough, New Zealand, it's a tiny, it's a tiny region when, when we talk. And, but they make, someone is making specific wine from every single valley within Marlborough. So you can get very, very different. It's depends on elevation, depends on soil, it depends on wind, depends on temperature. There are so many things. And you'll talk to Undine and she will basically say the same, even though it's a, it's a tiny region, Sonoma County, Sonoma. Um, you have uh, areas that are, have cooler climate um, that you can make that are more fit to, for a Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. If you talk about the Carneros area, you get more wind and, and more fogs and, uh, and cooler climate. And then you go to Dry Creek and Alexander mm -hmm. Valley. And over there we make Cab and Zin and other things. So it really depends where. So it's amazing to taste. We're actually doing on Friday, we're doing an uh, Instagram live uh, with uh, both Ondine on the one side, we'll do that at one time. It's Sauvignon Blanc Day, so I have to mention that uh, on Friday. So whatever your favorite winery is, you better do something to the people that are online and drink so we, a lot of Sauvignon Blanc that day. But uh, we, we're doing one, one session, live session on Instagram with Ondine to talk specifically about Sonoma and Sauvignon Blanc, uh, two different wines that we make over there. Uh, one is California and one is uh, from Sonoma and then uh, from Dry Creek. And then Simon um, Wagon from Waspola will actually talk in the afternoon and do a live session on Instagram as well. So it's going to be a fabulous uh, opportunity to, to really ask the winemakers how they feel and what is the difference between two different winemakers in two different regions um, that are apart, you know, thousands of miles away. Great. Thank you. And Maria, um... No one is making wine in two more diametrically opposite climates, uh, Pada, Mexico, uh, and the North Fork. But, uh, you know, you're new to the North Fork, but you have really shaken things up since you got there. And I'm kind of curious how much of the decision-making process is about the art of winemaking and how much of it is about science. Ah, well, we, you and I, we've talked about this a lot, right? Um, first of all, I think it's, it's great having the opportunity of doing wine in two regions. As Joab was saying, there's so many variables that, that are very different in one and the other. 
Parras is in the middle of nowhere, it's in the middle of the desert and it's a microclimate and the North Fork is, is a, it's basically a swamp. And, uh, and they're both pretty unknown regions. So to us, science is very important because it, it's a very powerful tool. As, as Julie was saying, you can never have enough testing. And uh, the more information you can share with, with your peers, the better for the whole industry. But basically, I see it as a huge matrix, right? To me, it's a huge matrix where you, where you start inputting information. And uh, science, on the one hand, will give you the powerful tools so you can make informed decisions. But I guess the gut of the winemaker and, um, and the experience of being there and uh, seeing one grape perform year after year or understanding why the Pinot Noir is always going to smell funky at the beginning in the North Fork, uh, but then it, smell, it smells funky at a different time than it does in Parras. And um, I think experience in the end will kind of ha go into that matrix as well. And there's always so many different ways of doing a wine or so many, so, or so many different um, paths to choose for a grape that the more information you put into that huge matrix, the better decisions you're going to take. Excellent. Excellent. Um, it, That's the fun part, right? Sorry. Yes. There's, there's yeah. so many variables that it just becomes fascinating. Um, while we're waiting for Yoab to come back, um, I'm going to go back to the question that when we uh, lost you for a second, Julie, if there is one of one variable of winemaking that you feel is the single most important, whether it's the fermentation process, um, uh, harvesting uh, your soil, um, what is it and why? Julie, you want to take that one? Yeah, it's it, that's pretty easy for me. It sounds a little it sounds a little trite, but it's it's easily the footsteps of the grower. It's, and I literally call my estate wine perspective. This is an old um, 1880s lithograph from Portobello Road in London, and it's called Perspective. And it kind of looks like you're at the start of a vine row looking down mm -hmm. and taking it all in and really trying to understand. I would say, honestly, I never pick a grape, one without tasting the area and really tasting it repeatedly, but two kind of without trying to get into it. And, thinking, what am I going to, once this wine is finished, what am I going to be drinking this wine? You know, what am I going to be eating when I'm drinking this wine? Um, so it's really being out there, listening to the vines, focusing right now, we're all out in bud break here. I know you're quite the opposite, you all down in, not in, down in New Zealand, but the, the idea is that from now on, our entire next six months, are all about being out there and focusing our attention on the vines. Even though I have a tiny little vineyard, there's still lots to do. Once it comes, once they come in, once we pick them, and even this 12 acres, we pick 12 different times because there's so many little microclimates that we've discovered because we paid attention to that. It's pretty exciting to do that because then you follow them into the vineyard, from the vineyard into the cellar, and you realize the power, for example, of natural fermentation, of wild yeast fermentation, just takes that robust, wonderful verve, that spirit inherent in each grape. I mean, no wonder as a human beings, we've always made, or we've just about always, I think, in modern history, made, some, made this beverage. It's pretty amazing. Paying attention to it in the vineyard and then bringing it in and doing a wild yeast ferment. Those are two things that really mark my, I guess, mark what makes my wine good, but also just what gives everybody around it great joy. Great. Right. You want to take a stab at that? Or do you want me to move to something a little more fun, guys? Um, on that respect, I think, uh, yeah, good fruit. Good fruit, good grapes make Excellent grapes make excellent wine, no tricks. Okay. Yoa? I mean, there are so many variables. I don't think there is one specific thing. I think that, you know, winemakers will say it's them. Growers will say it's all about us. I think there are so many things uh, that, that will add, you know, that 
yeah, again, I'm, I'm the one that will say that it's, it's a combination of everything of the, of the above to make, a, to make a good wine. I mean, um, I mean the, the technology these days is, is incredible almost everywhere in terms of uh, equipment that we now have versus, you know, even if 10 years ago, labs and things like that, that are super important. Uh, I think that old world wines are recognizing that as well, uh, that uh, technology and equipment is key mm -hmm. element as well. Um, I would say experience of winemakers and growers is, is super, super important. But at the end of the day, you know what, I'll surprise everyone and say, uh, you know, we all make good wines. I mean, it's, and it's all a lot of different things. I think it's about the, the, the customer at the end of the day. It's about the restaurant tour, the sommelier, the, 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 the consumer at home that sits at home and sip a glass of wine. So I think the, that's the most important component for me is to satisfy at the end of the day, the, the, the chef at the restaurant will make sure that the wine is paired well and the, the customer is having a great experience. So for me, this is the most important component. I, I, know, I know that a lot of winemakers are, what did you just say? But I would, uh, I think this is the most important thing is our customers, whatever they are, restaurants, hotels, the customers that are buying the wine, they are, it's endless, of, yeah, they're like, they go into the wine aisle, it's like going to Barnes and Nobles and picking a book. It's, it's impossible, it's like impossible. People are overwhelmed and, and will, you know, so I'm grateful for the, for the customers that, you know, that they, they say this is the wine we're gonna drink tonight or, at lunch uh, with, with our loved ones, with our friends. So I would say customers, it's the most important ingredient in, in making wine at the end of the awesome. day. Other wines, the wine will stay, will never stay, you know, will never open that bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Controversial answer, I guess. <laughs> um, so last question before we open it up to the audience. Um, so people were allowed to send questions in in advance and the, the single most asked question probably isn't going to surprise you given uh, the current environment. Uh, everyone wants to know what you are all drinking uh, <laughs> in isolation. And we've got to do this in like 30 seconds each. So Maria, you're up first. Um, I've actually been drinking a lot of our, our G Malbec from Mexico, but I'm, I'm running out and I can't, I can't seem to get it here now from Mexico during these times. Um, I've also been drinking a lot of Chateau Neuf du Pape. I don't know why. Okay. Okay. Good. Nice big Syrah Grenache. Uh, Julie. Uh, I'm drinking Rosé. I love Provencal Rosé and we make one um, from here of Zinfandel and Petite Syrah. It's just one of those things you can, if you really need to, you can start drinking in the morning and you don't have to worry about finishing up at night. But I also have to say, I'm drinking a lot of bubbles. You know, something about that just makes me happy. Hmm. I know next, uh, next Tuesday, I'm doing an Instagram um, with a chef and we're celebrating Cinco de Mayo. Well, we're gonna, I'm gonna be, I grow a lot of pomegranates. We're gonna be drinking pomegranate margaritas. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Um, and then Yoav. So it's a great opportunity for us to first of all, try all vintages of the wine that we make. And we never, you know, we're so busy in the day to day and you are like always trying the new vintage and how does it taste and you do comparator set. So it's a great opportunity to go back and, and visit all vintages of wine. Uh, our wine, you know, always joke. I mean, you, you age the wine and people ask me, is it ready? I'm like, yes, you can age it on the way home from, the, from Whole Foods when you buy it or wine.com, wherever like until you drink it tonight. This is the age time, how, how long you need to age our wines. I mean, it's all ready to drink now, but in more, more serious answer will be, I mean, I'm honestly, we have, we have, we are blessed to work in this industry. There are so many people that, you know, that we know that, that it's an opportunity to actually uh, drink their wines as well. Um, I, I love the wines from, from here, from California, to be honest, and from Sonoma. Uh, so that's definitely something I'm focusing on, but I'm, I'm literally, drinking wine from all over the world. It's a great, I mean, opportunity to drink wine from New Zealand, Australia, eh, Argentina, South Africa, Israel. And um, so I'm, I'm blessed. I would love to try from uh, Maria wine from, uh, from Mexico actually, and from New York. So that's definitely on my, on uh, my, to, my new to-do list. And um, Julie's wine, I, I know we were sitting, we were standing next to one another, but it just, an, it's a, an amazing opportunity to support your, your own industry with people that you know and you want to help the small wineries and, and just to drink their wine. And, you know, I've been drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> More than ever. Be, yeah, that seems to be the common theme. 
Yeah. Um, all that wine behind me is actually my sort of um, stay at home wine project. These are all wines uh, in my cellar that are produced by Columbia alumni. So uh, I thought that I might have maybe 25 or so in my cellar, but um, believe it or not, uh, I found 57 uh, different wines and those are all behind me. And so uh, we've been exploring uh, wine regions all over the world uh, lately. Uh, but trying to concentrate on supporting Columbia alums. So we're going to kick it open for uh, questions from the audience. And the first one is, I'm going to actually ask the three of you to just give me a quick answer. It comes from Nick, who's in Singapore. He's a SIPA alum, and he wants to know, what is the new world wine region that we should be keeping an eye on? So I'm going to start with somebody who's in the new world, Yoab. Well, actually, you all are in the new world, but um, what's the hot new region we should be thinking about? You know, so it's a, um, one, I guess, from um, Passos will be super interesting. And we always, I mean, just, you know, we don't pay enough attention to that region. Uh, so I think Paso will be, will be one area that I would say uh, go and uh, that region is a phenomenal region with with amazing climate to to make great wine. So pasta will be one, and then I'll go back to New Zealand. We always so focus on Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, but we make phenomenal Chenin Blanc uh, from New Zealand, mm. and there is Pinot Noir from New Zealand. It is fantastic and amazing value for money for half the price you can. I mean, quarter of the price you can you can probably get French uh, Burgundies that are. I mean, different style of wine, but still. So I would uh, encourage people to try different varietals from the, from the same region that they really love, but try something else. I mean, they, they, it's just a great opportunity to do that. So I don't have any other specific, but I think one, as I said, pasta would be one, and then New Zealand just to try different varietals and not just to drink Sauvignon Blanc, even though it's so delicious. Yeah. Good. Uh, Julie? I'd, I'd, uh, I'd say Northeastern Italy and Slovenia pretty cool things. And I'd also say um, the Willamette Valley, if only because um, they're experimenting with new varieties and they're all hanging together. I really identify with their organic biodynamic farming and thoughtful yeah. farming. And then we've been also sourcing some grapes from the Sierra Nevada, which um, going outside the region, going outside Napa, gives us an opportunity to experiment with some things that we've never made before. That's lots of fun. Um, I definitely think there's there's so many. I, I do have to say the North Fork is, uh, it, it has been pretty amazing to me. Um, a lot of certified sustainable wine, uh, wineries and uh, a lot of whites, these crisp, amazing uh, sparklings, the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that the North Fork even exists and it has amazing wines. And then uh, Parras in Mexico, it's actually the oldest wine growing region in the whole continent. Our neighbors have been making wine there for more than 500 years, and it's still a very unknown region. And uh, Mexico has exploded in, in winemaking in the last five years, and I feel like there's many interesting things coming out of there as well. Great. Um, the next question comes from Julie, who is a SIPA alum, and uh, Julie, I'm going to ask you to actually take this because of a lot of the work that you've done um, powering women in the wine industry. Are advocates of gender equity in the industry concerned about the progress that's been made over the past decade um, being jeopardized by the impact of COVID-19? Boy, that would take some thinking in that restaurants, I would say restaurants and wineries uh, now are increasingly populated with women who have now reached a parity in terms of education. Education, So you see more and more women graduating from programs that are important, be it culinary programs or being it viticultural and, and enology programs. So sure, the people who are first in line are the first people to get cut, especially if businesses. Um, you know, I think of young line chefs coming up 
um, at restaurants. I go immediately there. There are only still only about 12 or 14 percent of employees in California are uh, wine employees are um, are women. So we still have a long ways to go. Um, but I hope I I hope just because we're land based that a lot of wineries do open. Um, we certainly have a labor shortage now. Um, but I think that and and women are obviously they're fully equipped, ready to, ready to assume those roles. But I do think about a lot of the support people and the people in the vineyard and the people in, uh, in uh, the restaurant hospitality trade mm -hmm. that could very well get hit very, very badly. These are all people who are hungry and young and excited about flavor and taste and ah, they're working awfully hard. The takeout people, the people at the takeout windows, we all need to just give a little extra salute to them right now, and many of them, if not most of them, are women. Great, thank you. Um, next question is for you, Maria. What's better if you don't finish a bottle of wine uh, for keeping it? Use a cork or put, the put it in a bottle with a screw cap? It's better to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't you? We knew you, you were going to say that. You can share it. If you can't finish it, then you should share it. And if you don't do either of those, um, I guess I usually just use, if it comes in a cork, I use a cork. If it doesn't, then I use a screw cap. But I am thinking I would, uh, if I had to decide, I would say cork would be a little better because it would let it oxygenate a little more. As long as it's, it's fully sealed and in the refrigerator, it should last for a week at least. Good. Yoab, um, this question comes from um, Christine, who is uh, a business school alum. Do you have any advice uh, in this time from transitioning from a corporate career into wine? <laughs> I think it's the best time, actually. You know, first of all, you, I, I, Zoom and, and all those platforms are available to everyone. Uh, w CT and, and others. So it's, I think it's a great opportunity for people to go online, get that education. That's one thing that is always good. And people always ask me, it's like, you know, the secret is, is to drink more wine. So <laughs> you just to, to taste, to taste more and, and you just train your palate. It's like, it's like everything else. And, you know, you want to get better at that, you better practice and you better just try different things and, and do, you know, see what you like. See mm -hmm. what you don't like. This is the most important thing. Forget about scores by, by the writers. And, and first of all, see what you like and don't like. And then started to, to do some blind tasting. It's, it's a great opportunity, actually, uh, at that period of time. I mean, it's great if you have partners you can do it with. But overall, I think it's absolutely phenomenal time. And, and th those courses, you know, are, are available to anyone. Uh, and some of them are pretty basic. So yeah, I would say it's a, it's a great time to kind of, even if you're not planning to be a professional, I think it's a great opportunity for people just to kind of uh, take a stab and, and get better in that. It, I think it will make all of us happier if you love more people that, that know more about, about wine and love wine, so why not? Okay, good. Um, this is a quick question for the three of you. Is there something you know now you wish you had known sooner? about your um, world, your work in wine. Maria? Oof, um, I don't know, my first initial thought was so much, but then no, nothing, because I, it, it, would, it would have changed the experience that I've lived. And I think wine is so diverse, and that's why it's, it's, so, it's a, such a rich culture. And uh, as I said, it's a huge matrix that you, that you learn to fit things into it. So we'll always keep learning. I love it because you never, you can never know enough about wine or winemaking or gro growing grapes or anything. Okay, great. Anybody else want to? I think, I think you're so, I think you're so right, Maria. For me, it's always been a bit of the serendipity factor. It's like, okay, it's not exactly come what may, but it's take advantage or open, your do open the door to new experience um, and have some fun with it. Actually, now at this point, I wish I'd paid more attention to uh, social media technology, but, <laughs> but that, hasn't, that hasn't, just, just being, just leaving the door open to the serendipity factor, I think is a good thing. Okay, great. 
Yeah, I think uh, what you know. Sometimes I, I wish I paid more attention at the, at, while I was in business school. Quite honestly, <laughs> it would have probably helped me a little bit more. But I think you just learn from from you know learn on the go. You learn from your your mistakes like any other business. Uh, I think it's actually many times it's the best way to learn is is to learn from from your mistakes until you don't experience on your own. Uh, you don't really know. Um, so. I think I'm surrounding myself with people, you know, super talented, they have more experience, more knowledge uh, than, than me. And I think this is the best way to basically make sure that you have, you have, you know, good, good foundation for any business. So I would say that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm blessed with really an amazing, amazing team um, that is with me. So I'm, I would say people is probably my, my number one asset. And again, upsetting my, my winemaker, even though they are, assets as well are part of that human you know the, the, the people i'm surrounded by so i'm i feel you know this is i would say uh, yeah that's that that's you know will be my uh, my answer to that okay um next question is um for you yoab uh i'm i'm uh, it's from christy who is a general studies alum i'm south african and have been following the restrictions on alcohol sales uh, how has COVID-19 and the COVID-19 situation impact uh, wine imports and exports? So uh, thank God for, for, first of all, to, for our governor here, here in California, we, we're considered to be an essential business. So, you know, the minute this is over, I'm going to, I don't, they won't allow me to hug him probably, but I would, I would, you know, all those people, all those growers and the people that are, you know, making wine. I mean, uh, Julie said that as well, that she, she was making wine today or bottling wine today. And same for us, we're bottling wine, making wine. So we, we feel very, very lucky. Same, same thing. Probably I, I owe a hug to the, to the prime minister in New Zealand as well. She, this is an essential business. The winemakers can go out, go do harvest and, and make wine right now. So, um, South Africa, unfortunately, I've been uh, watching the, the news over there, and that's really, really unfortunate. That's impacting everyone. I think there are less uh, containers that are available around the world. There is less dry goods, glass, um, corks, everything. Is, is, uh, this is something that, that is becoming more, uh, more of like our problem as well. Um, so, you know, hopefully those businesses, uh, I mean, People really need to realize those leaders need to realize that yes I mean I'm, I'm you know I have a smile on my face but this is an essential I think this is an essential business I mean this is keeping a lot of people employed and uh, and we can't stop that I mean we have to stop that as long as we, we, we're taking all the precautions uh, that need to be taken so it's absolutely affecting um, winemaking around the world my heart goes to to South Africa I mean I'm, I love that country and love the wine that come from South Africa so it's it's really, really sad um, to, to see we export to, to almost uh, 40 countries around the world. And it's interesting to talk to everyone and see, you know, each one of them, how it's affecting their business on, on, all, this, on all levels, you know, from winemaking to, to, to restaurants that are closed, to, to employees that have to get to, that they lay off. And it's, it's heartbreaking to, to hear that and, and, and to see that, but uh, hopefully things will get back in uh, uh, for everyone and we'll be able to drink wine from around the world and uh, and that thing will that cycle will be over soon and we'll get back to business okay thank you um maria question from luis uh a business school alum do you think nebbiolo is set to be the flagship grape of mexico given its wide uh adoption in baja and is paras um a climate that would um suit Nebbiolo? Um, you know, I don't, I don't love the flagship grape for any region because I, I think, I, I've said it before, diversity is, is key and, and trial and error and you need to experiment and, and see and figure out what you can do best. Plus, every winemaker has a different approach and every, every company has a different approach into making wine or growing a certain type of grape. I do think, however, it's a, it's a great grape in Mexico. It hasn't been around for that long. It, this is a new trend that, that's probably three or four years old. So I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's as big as, um, as we think just yet. It, we actually have 
13 different varietals that we're experimenting with, we've always changed them. So we, we take, we add some and we take and we use some. Uh, we've been successful with Malbec, which is our new, our new RG wine. We're now experimenting with Tempranillo, Petit Verdot. I, we have Nebbiolo on our ranks and it's good. It's not one of my favorite ones, but I think it, it will make the cut at some point. It's always good to experiment because as much as you can say, I want to make the best Merlot in the world, if, you're, if your expression of your terroir is not amazing, uh, you, you're never going to know. And then you get some huge surprises, like our orange wine was made with Palomino and the skins of a Riesling, which was uh, very rare for Parras. And, um, and then we have a great chin in Blanc in Parras that was, that was also unexpected. Uh, you, never, you never quite know. I do think it's a strong grape, but I, I don't love flagship grapes. I, I love experimentation. Okay, and then um, the, we got time for one or two more. Julie, you mentioned dry farming and we've had a couple of people ask if you could explain the concept. Well, it's really a very old concept and you go all over the world and, and what you see is dry farming. Uh, irrigation or drip irrigation in a formal plastic tube sort of regulated way um, is relatively new even to the Napa Valley in the 1960s. So before that time, I guess farmers pulling horses, uh, you know, bucketed water into newly growing vines. Part of the key thing to dry farming is preparing your soil, keeping your soil full of bioorganic matter and encouraging the microbiomes. So encouraging exactly what Maria was saying, not only in varietals, but in the whole habitat, making the habitat in the soil and the surrounding areas as diverse as possible. Um, all of that helps do several things. Sequester water, sequester carbon, reduce erosion. And the idea about dry farming is, it's kind of funny to be doing that now and have that considered cutting edge, but because you do it with tests and you do it with more data and you do it with a mindful eye, it really, um, our belief is that it's the clearest way to get to an expression of terroir, the expression of the place. Um, and even if it's old, it's sort of bringing, bringing new to old in a way. Um, diversity, health of soil is all the foundation of dry farming. It just simply means no irrigation other than mother nature and preparing the soil to be um, healthy enough. It helps, it helps if you're paying attention to the vines and to the diversity of the microbiome in the soil. Okay, so we have to wrap up, um, but what we wanna do before I close the program uh, with a couple of announcements in our drawing is the four of us would like to toast all of you um, for both joining us and wishing you uh, health and safety uh, during this time. So, uh, Julie, what will you be toasting with? Well, I am toasting with my Zinfandel right. because it's the, one, it's the one that's open. Um, although I have got a bottle of, of um, my Port Cano handy as well, Ken. Um, and to everyone's good health and, and welfare and those of your friends and family. Too. Maria. Our beautiful unfil unfiltered Cabernet Franc from the North Fork. Cheers and thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Ben. What are you going to toast with, Yoav? I'm uh, I'm double fisting here. I'm going to toast okay. with uh, with my rosé, my Angels and Colors rosé 2019, a Grenache base. And uh, as you mentioned, Ken, it's your favorite, so I have to pick that one as well. So I'm going to have both wines. Uh, and I'm probably going to walk home instead of uh, driving. Um, so cheers, everyone. Thank you for all those people that, you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning in Israel. I probably should have said it. My The wine that you need to discover is also in, in Israel, uh, a new region, old, old world, but uh, making phenomenal wines. But uh, thank you for everyone that, you know, put their alarm for 2 o'clock in the morning, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia. I mean, everyone around the world, thank you so much for supporting us and uh, listening and, uh, and drinking wine. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. I am, I, and in, in fairness, uh, so now play favorites. 
I'm drinking uh, one of Mark Tarlov. Uh, he's a the law school alum, uh, one great Pinot Noir winemaker. His Alit from the Willamette Valley. Good health to all of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and so, cheers from the CAA and our, our wine industry network. And we're going to take a quick sip. And then finally, um, next week's installment is um, improvising uh, virtu our virtual lives at home, lessons from jazz, which will be led by Associate Professor of Music and a GSAS alum, Chris Washburn. And that'll be next Wednesday at 7 p.m. And you can register at alumnicolumbia.edu and you'll see we will send out an invitation for that. Um, and then finally, the winner of our case of mixed wines from our alumni winemakers is a GS and looks like VPNS alumna and current GSAS student, Jacqueline DeBedvar. Congratulations, Jacqueline. And uh, that concludes this evening's uh, Columbia at Home. We hope you've all drank responsibly during this hour. And remember, uh, you may go to See You Win is um, Julie's promo code. Salud, S-A-L-U-D. And then Yoab, it is Columbia 30, 30% 30 off at Cherry Splash website on all the wines and free shipping all over the country on 12 hours or more. So Columbia 30. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Julie, John. Thank you. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> Take care. Stay healthy. Bye. Drink a lot of wine. Yes. <laughs>